So, uh, yes, let's just start the interview. So, hey, Ecofictologists, welcome back to the channel. This week we're doing something a little different and very exciting. Um, we've got a guest on our channel. This is Francesca Trotman. I'm going to call her Chess because that's how I met her. Um, we met in Mozambique in 2014, we just figured out, which is six yeah. years ago. It's slightly <laughs> terrifying that that's that long ago. <laughs> Um, she was there <laughs> doing her master's thesis, I think, and um, yeah, I was there on an underwater photography course and loved it. And now she's, Mozambique kind of took a hold of you, didn't it? Yeah, didn't, didn't ever leave. <laughs> didn't let go. Because um, um, yeah. now you're based there and, and Chess has founded her own marine conservation organization called Love the Ocean. So, of course, my first question is, just to hand it over to you and uh, just tell us a bit about yourself and Love the Oceans and how it all started. Yeah, so um, I am currently in Mozambique, hence the like straw hut behind me. And um, I spend about 70% uh, of my time here and the rest of the time I'm usually in the UK um, grafting to be able to spend time here. <laughs> um, and, uh, Basically, yeah, Love the Oceans is a marine conservation organization um, and uh, I started it because I first came to Mozambique in 2013, seven years ago. What? <laughs> um, and um, I was on the same photography course that you were on um, the following year and um, I, well, I fell in love with the country then or maybe more the marine life because I didn't spend that much time in the community. Um, and then, but I also saw my first shark killing, so humans killing sharks. And at the time I was at university studying um, marine biology and sharks had been my passion from a very young age, which is why I went into marine bio. Um, and then I, uh, yeah, saw my first shark killing. Then I went back to university. So between 2013 and 2014, um, I, went back to uni and found a supervisor that was supervised me and took three research assistants out with me and then in 2014 returned to Mozambique and spent I think it was about four months with the shark fishermen there um, collecting data uh, for my master's thesis to work out how bad the shark fin trade was because the reason that these sharks were being caught um, was for the shark fin trade so for people that don't know what that is that's basically um, when the fins are taken off a shark and uh, harvested and then served in something called shark fin soup which is basically a delicacy um, in the east and it's like served at like weddings and things to show affluence um, and yeah, so basically I wanted to work out how bad the shark fin trade was because although it was upsetting seeing the actual sharks killed um, in 2013 when I first saw it, um, I realised that on a small scale, yes, that's upsetting individually, but if that's happening on a much larger scale, that's pretty detrimental to the local marine ecosystem. So I wanted to work out what exactly was going on and how bad it was. So I collected my master's um, data. Uh, in 2014 when I met you and then I was writing up my thesis and got the exact results you'd think in terms of um, sustainability with the shark fin trade so it's unsustainable and um, potential cascade effect through the marine food web and detrimental effects for the food security in the area because um, this coastal community relies on fish as a protein source um, and I needed more data to be able to publish a paper because I didn't have enough data um, to be able to get my stats significant which meant I couldn't publish a paper which meant I couldn't effectively lobby the government for legislation change um, so I initially founded Love the Oceans to continue my master's um, data collection uh, and continue the fisheries research but I soon realized um, that well basically as soon as I founded Love the Oceans which was in the November of 2014 I was like my whole life was just reading up on like successful conservation strategies and NGOs and how to run things <laughs> and how to do it. Yeah, because you uh, just jumped right realized, into it, didn't you? you just... Yeah, exactly. Like I was just like, yeah, let's do that. Um, we like no previous, I hadn't even volunteered previously at any organizations or anything like that. So like I'd done like beach cleans and stuff, but nothing like residential. Um, so it was like a proper jump in the deep end <laughs> um, <laughs> so basically like the more I read up the more I realized that it needed to be a multi-pronged approach um, the government here uh, 
aren't just going to stop shark finning because a lot of money comes from that so you've got to provide financial incentives to stop it you've got to provide multiple reasons to stop it and proof like aka science um that <laughs> it's going to have a really bad effect on the environment if it continues and so that's where all of our different areas kind of sprung from so now we work um we do a lot of different areas of research five different areas we do we've continued the fisheries research that i started but expanded that just from sharks through to all fisheries um and then we do humpback whale research which is the financial incentive for the establishment of um, the marine protected area so basically i changed the mission of the organization from just stopping shark finning to establishing a marine protected area here as a whole because the marine protected area will bring in a lot of tourism uh, the idea being transitioning over from unsustainable fishing to um, marine tourism which is sustainable and renewable um and well the diving was just beautiful when when i was there it's some of the best diving that that i've ever done yeah exactly like it's it's gorgeous people travel all over the world but people also don't know that mozambique is like the whale migration here is epic like people just don't even know some people i come into contact with they're like oh you work in mozambique what do you do and i mention whales and they're like wow they have whales and i'm like so many you have no idea <laughs> yeah, exactly sitting at breakfast just um, watching whales jump out of the water it's, it's like yeah exactly that's why i keep looking over the top of my laptop because i've got a sea view at my at my house and i keep spotting whales jumping around <laughs> um Not and jealous um, at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the whales are like the financial incentive um and then we do coral reef research which is basically to prove that what we have here is worth protecting and that it needs protection and all of these kind of areas um, mix in with each other as well, because obviously you've got like destructive fishing methods being used, which affect the coral reefs. Um, and occasionally humpback whales are caught by the fishing nets and things as well. So they all kind of like interact as well. Um, then we have our marine megafauna research. So that's whale sharks mainly. We do have manta rays here as well, but they're less common. So um, the focus of that is really the whale sharks. And then, um, and that's again, the financial incentive um, proving that if we can prove a high number of these megafauna individuals, say humpback whales, manta rays, um, and whale sharks, then that's you know a really good source of income, and you can basically guarantee that you're going to have a solid tourism base. Um, and then we have our ocean trash research as well, and that's basically looking at the huge amount of trash that washes up on our shores, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with because the press has obviously ocean trash has been a big topic for the last couple of years. Um, and then we run two education programs as well, teaching basic marine resource management to 10 to 13 year olds, working with adults as well. And uh, then we also teach swimming uh, with an ambassador scheme and a sustainable livelihood scheme as well attached to that. So it's cool. it's like loads of different areas. <laughs> um yeah there's much more the than idea... i thought it was <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah yeah amazed. exactly so the idea is that it's a, like a holistic approach so the way that we work is we kind of like identify a barrier that can stand in someone's way of living a more sustainable life and then working to erase that barrier um or help that group or individual or whoever it is overcome that barrier very cool very cool and kind of the the inspiration for me asking you to do this interview was that I saw you on Instagram that you uh, recently had a chat with um, photographers without borders. Is that right? And they, yeah. uh, they had a segment on uh, storytelling and conservation. Um, and when I saw it, I got really excited. <laughs> so um, can you tell us a bit about the conversation that you had with them? Yeah, so they're actually one of our partners. Um, Danielle De Silva, the founder, is an amazing human being. Um, she's so cool. And Jeff Garriock actually comes out here every year as well. He's one of the photographers and, and one of the um, key people in Photographers Without Borders. Um, we came into contact with them initially in 2016. Uh, basically, Danielle founded the organization because there's a massive gap between like um, NGO work and creating media because an NGO can't spend loads of money on um, employing a really great photographer or videographer, but they need that collateral to be able to show people what they're doing right. and be able to say like this is why we need this money, but they can't get money to start with. So there's this like spiral of like just a disconnect between it. So she started the organization initially to send um, photographers, photographers overseas and videographers overseas um, and create media for different organizations. So they found us 
and they sent um, someone out, Jeff Hester, who um, actually is filmed for Blue Planet and all the rest of it now. Um, but they sent him out in 2016 and he created the first ever media that we had for our organization that was like of a professional standard. Um, and that was incredible. And then they came out, Danielle and uh, Jeff Garriott, different Jeff, same organization, <laughs> um, came out in 2018, 2018 and filmed a documentary on us because um, they have a series uh, where they film documentaries on different NGOs they work with. Um, and that's on our website if anyone wants to watch it. And then they also uh, run a photography workshop with us every year where basically they, they um, Jeff Garriott actually runs it and it's like a 10 day period and it's learning how to tell a story through media. Um, usually it's photographs. So it's a storytelling for change workshop, basically. Uh, and they do like a, essentially a case study on us. So my job is like, walking them around, driving them around and telling them about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So they have that background story on the photos that they're taking. And then it allows them to also form a narrative in their head um, and what, what they want to be told. Also, it gives me the opportunity to create media around different campaigns that I know that will be running and coming up, which is really great for an NGO because we get access to all of the photographers and um, media. Obviously we credit them and all the rest of it, but it means that when we come to campaigns and stuff, that's really useful. Um, and then, yeah, Danielle asked me, cause I asked her to be on our, we've got a weekly Q and A that we run. And then she asked me to be on um, <laughs> story telling for change at the moment. Everyone's just exchanging online digital <laughs> platforms. Um, and uh, yeah, so she asked me to be on the, um, storytelling for change uh, series that they're running and they've had some ridiculously awesome people on there they had like Christina Matamaya and a bunch of different people all running different workshops around different subjects so obviously mine was around like marine conservation and how storytelling comes into play there um, so it was a lot of like conversations around how important media is essentially to creating change and how um, pictures are lovely but if there's a story behind them it becomes a lot more meaningful um, and in terms of communication for us for like fundraisers donors um, grants sponsors general audience because we we operate we have our non-profit and we have our charity and our non-profit runs volunteer programs and that volunteer program fee covers costs because we don't charge that much but it, any excess funds funds our scientific research um, so it's it's also important in terms of keeping the organization running. So our media is like a cross between education, educational outreach and, and um, getting people to think about sustainability, but we also need to attract people to our volunteer programs and we need to communicate to our donors what we're doing and prove that we're doing what we say we're doing and launch new campaigns and Kickstarters and all the rest of it. So it's, it's quite complex, but um, storytelling is like absolutely integral to that. So that's our connections with um, Photographers Without Borders. Um, they're really, really cool. They yeah, and I will fun. absolutely be linking lots of links in the description below. So, um, and I'm sure you'll, you can provide me with all the necessary links <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so that people can check them out because they sound really amazing. Um, and you're a photographer yourself. I mean, as we've established, I was there doing an underwater photography course that you would you had already done and um yeah. if, if you've if you follow chess on instagram you are constantly bombarded with photos that make you insanely <laughs> jealous um and they're, they're beautiful um so is that your your nice. chosen media of of storytelling or do you use other media as well yeah i mean so so my i do photography but i would say that i can tell a story better with love the oceans because there is such a good story to tell um so and and because our work here we work in a very small community so when the photographers come and they take photos of like certain kids i know all the kids so it's like a really easy narrative like i can be like this is chelsea she's seven years old she's and then give a whole background on to like how long she's been coming to our swimming lessons and what her future looks like and all of that kind of stuff um, so it's a much easier narrative to come up with that can, and I know what works and what like hits people's hearts and what is going to get people to donate or take whatever action we want them to take. Um, and I, I live and breathe love the ocean. So that's like, um, my, probably the thing that I'm passionate about. 
Um, my photography, to be honest, it's more of a means to an end. Um, I do try and like, if there is an opportunity to tell a story, I will tell a story. But some of my work is um, like I sell online and um, I work for like different uh, companies going to various different countries. I use it as a travel tool. So I'll work for a brand and shoot for them for a little bit. Um, so it's more of a supplementary income than a amazing storytelling platform. Um, photographers that I've wanted to do a much better job of it, which is why <laughs> I kind of uh, use their images and then caption it with something like pair it with a caption that will also tell a story. So on our Love the Oceans media, it's a lot more uh, social media. It's a lot more um, storytelling and my personal photography is a lot more just like pretty images um as much as i would love i try and use it for education where i can but there's not a whole lot when i'm doing like free diving shoots or um shooting for a brand there's not a huge story to be told there unless the brand has specifically asked me to tell a story in which case i'll invest my time and energy in that too yeah that makes sense i mean if if you have an opportunity to to bring something you're passionate about into your storytelling then the people who are hearing it or reading it they're going to feel that and they're going to be more connected so if it comes from a place of of passion and enthusiasm it's going to be yeah going to connect with more people that makes total sense yeah um on this on this channel on eco fictology we talk a lot about how uh storytelling and and eco fiction as a genre is used in science communication so at the moment I feel like we scientists in general could do a little bit better on the science communication yeah, front. I know definitely. many, many scientists <laughs> who are not so great at talking to the public in a way that they can understand. Um, but I've yeah. been talking about it. I've been talking about the effect that ecofiction could have on people in like a theoretical sense because this is how I imagine it would happen and how I think it could work. Um, but you are in the field and your field is conservation. And um, do you have like on the ground evidence of, of storytelling really making a difference in conservation action? Uh, yeah, um, a lot of it's not fiction, it's nonfiction. Of course, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, um, but uh, it 100% it's like integral to our organization so um the one that is still like a well all of its stories unfolding so it's always evolving and changing a lot um but like we've had uh one of the one of my favorite like probably easiest demonstrations of um storytelling on why it's so useful is like so we started properly taking care of media and, and jeff came out as photographer of that borders basically we started properly taking photos and stuff when we partnered with photographers of that borders um and that's great because jeff came out in 2016 right and we teach 10 to 13 year olds um basic marine resource management in the schools and he came to the schools and he shot some photos of the lessons and stuff and some of those kids I mentioned that we teach swimming so some of those kids come to our swimming lessons and obviously 2016 now is four years ago those kids have grown up a little bit since they've been in our classes and um two kids in particular bento and mario have been in those photos happened to be in those photos in 2016 and have continued to come through our swimming lessons and they've really excelled like they're they're probably like our two bestest and brightest um, of our swimmers and the idea with the swimming program is that there's beginner, intermediate and advanced. When they get to advanced, they um, can, they're offered the opportunity to become what we call an ocean conservation champion, which is just a term that we came up with. But basically it um, means that we offer them the opportunity to do love, love the ocean sponsored qualifications. So that can be like their swimming teachers, that can be their diving, that can be their surfing, that can be their skipper licenses, all pretty much um, marine based because with the creation of the marine protected area, the job creation will be in the marine ecotourism space. Um, so that's about providing them with a source of income, alleviating poverty, poverty alleviation is crucial to successful conservation, um, but also um, they then become an ambassador in their community and run their own conservation workshops. So you have culturally integrated change happening too at the same time. 
Um, and the storytelling comes into play really strongly with those two because first of all, it's people. So it's really easy to tell a story and get like your audience to kind of buy into it and, and invest in those individuals. Um, and Benton and Mario happen to be in those photos from 2016. And obviously we have had, we've been partnered with Photographers Without Borders since then. So we've had photographers out um, more or less on a constant basis taking photos each year. Um, and you've seen these kids grow up and now Bento and Mario are older and they're, Bento's 18, Mario's um, 17. And they're our ocean conservation champions, our OCCs. And they're doing their diving qualification and they both want to work with Love the Oceans, which means they'll probably, they'll probably, oh, and they're doing their English qualifications at the same time. Um, and it will probably mean that they'll also do their swimming instructor qualifications next year, which means that they can help out with swimming lessons teaching too. Um, and you've got this like really lovely journey that's been documented over time. Um, the problem with coastal conservation is it does take a long community coastal conservation is it does take a long time so a lot of like the stories are going to come from a longer period of like time chapters, especially the science like snapshots throughout yeah time. yeah and especially with the science as you well know like time series data sets are so important especially with like our coral reef research well all of the research it's showing trends over a longer period of time so being able to portray that through storytelling is really important too. Yeah. Oh, that sounds so nice. It must be so nice for you to, be able to <laughs> like watch, watch you, the, the, I guess the benefit of what you're doing, watch the, the good stuff that you're putting into the community actually in front of you and really engage with you and, and you can watch them grow up. It must be really nice for you. Yeah, it's lovely. It does make you work harder as well because like uh, in the next couple of years we're likely to get a period poverty scheme off the ground and um, we're still doing some base research on it um, on like cultural appropriateness and things like that for different um, like menstrual health products and things like that but um, that kind of thing can change the face of um, women's future in the community and because I work with uh, all the kids directly like Chelsea I mentioned earlier she's seven at the moment she's got a future ahead of her obviously and being able to shape a future which gives her more opportunities that if she wants to take them like yeah she might want to go into a traditional female role in this community but she might want to try different things uh, as will the other kids as well so it gives you that extra drive as well um, having such a close relationship because you can storytell you can like choose that that kid or whatever as long as obviously parents approve of it and all the rest of it but if if the family is happy with it then you can use that kid as almost like a case study um to be like look this is and, and make your audience connect with that person um and help them use them as the face of the campaign and help and they can help also change the future for their peers um so yeah it's uh, having that personal connection really helps the drive. For sure. And like you said, all, all the stories that you're telling are nonfiction. Like you're, you're telling mm. real, the stories of real people and real events in a real place and everything. Um, and there's, there is a diff I mean, there is a difference in the connection that you get between a nonfiction story and a fictional story. But do you think there's a place for, for fiction in this kind of space? Yeah, definitely. I think that fiction is really important in um, inspiring and capturing people um, so that your fiction often you can emotionally invest in a lot more. Um, so there's definitely something to be said for eco fiction because especially for youngsters, getting them invested from a young age um, and sometimes that they might read a book or whatever not thinking about the eco side of it and it could be an eco fiction book but they haven't even really paid attention to the fact that it's an eco fiction book but they're getting subliminal messaging like the entire way through and then the kind of moral of the story is look up to the environment and um like a lot of like the dr zeus books like the lorax and stuff like that oh, is such like i love it i'm 27 and i love that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like books like that yes they're eco-fiction obviously but they can be they can inspire a generation and that's what a lot of Dr. Zeus's books did to be honest 
Um, so there is definitely something to be said for that. Yeah. Do you think, so do you think that um, like fiction about conservation and such would be more powerful if geared towards a younger audience rather than an adult audience? Or do you think it'll reach people no matter what? Uh, it depends what type of fiction you're talking about. I think Dr. Zeus speaks to all generations, like, I love those. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I think there's definitely a young audience to be captured by ecofiction. I've got some, I've got one of my close friends wrote a book, uh, ecofiction book about um, the plastic bag. And that's, I think it's for like four year olds. So it's, it's a definitely a young audience, but it really gets them thinking about like, changing their plastic consumption habits um so there's that and then for the older um for older people i.e not children <laughs> um, <laughs> there's still definitely an area for eco fiction i haven't read that much myself to be honest um my reading either is um non-fiction well it's just non-fiction right now <laughs> yeah you have no time for reading much. for pleasure <laughs> <laughs> just saving the um, ocean <laughs> um i i would like to read some more fiction i think i just haven't really had much time to be honest and there's so many subjects that i really want to educate myself on um so but i think there's definitely a a area for it obviously if it's clear that it's fiction and all the rest of it and people don't read it thinking that it's um, non-fiction but providing all of that i think there's definitely room for um yeah eco-fiction for adults i think there's definitely room for that because what you just said is there are so many topics that you want to educate yourself on and sometimes i find that people don't want to talk about like climate change or uh, extinction or um, habitat loss and all these things because they're not very well informed about it and they don't actually know that much. They're kind of unsure. So it's like me with politics. I don't want to have a conversation about politics because I will out myself with how little I know about politics. So I kind of, yeah. I kind of see eco-fiction as, or yeah, storytelling as being able to reach people to give them the tools to be able to talk about some of these things can maybe learn something from those narratives and then we can get the conversation yeah. going which is really important yeah yeah definitely it can be a gentle introduction to a quite a hard meaty topic um i would yeah 100 percent agree um and on my channel i've i've spoken about kind of this um the need for a bit more hope in in the narratives about climate change and and everything that we're losing um because if it's if it's all depressing and pessimism all the time then we lose kind of this <laughs> like you just get weighed down and you kind of think oh well what's the point then yeah what am i doing um so we need a bit more hope and do you find that in the stories that you tell whether they're uh, so that even the non-fiction stories um, that the success stories do they do they reach people more do they get more of a response than kind of the the stories about the decline and and everything that we're losing yeah I think the hope aspect is like really crucial to storytelling because otherwise you just bum people out and to be honest they usually tune off your channel if it's just like constant negativity <laughs> um and I think the world's kind of historically been quite oversaturated with like negative guilt tripping um and like you know look how horrible this is you have to give money to help it I don't think that that kind of like shock um media works as well anymore I think that people have been de desensitized to it because we've like I remember being young and still seeing adverts on TV of like water aid and things like that like oh, look yeah. at these kids starving yeah. you have to donate text three te text and you'll donate three pounds that kind of thing so we've literally grown up with it like constantly bombarded with like this shock media trying to trying to make you go oh my gosh I care like this is so shocking that I've help. got to care about this and yeah and, and donate and so I think um shock media yes okay it does work sometimes um but the world there's a lot of horrible stuff going on and i think that we have become desensitized to that so hope media is um can be a lot more effective or at least we found so for everything that we post even if it's negative news um we still try to give an action so it's like um 
this is what the problem is this is what we're doing about it this is what you can do about it um and giving people that action to be able to do something is really important um as part of like providing that hope because um you need to provide people with evidence that whatever you're um saying will be a way for like will be will take it won't necessarily solve the problem but it could help get closer to the solution um and then you also need to provide people with an actionable item so that they can donate or fundraise or share or like or whatever it is that you're asking them to do um so that they can help and contribute and feel that they're doing something because they hope that it will make a difference not because they've been shocked or guilt tripped into it <laughs> yeah i yeah i've i've spoken about ecological grief on the channel and um how it's becoming so prevalent and it's 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 becoming a real like field of psychology like the psychologists are being trained in how to treat people and help people cope with with ecological grief because it's just something that's weighing down everybody at the moment and if we can if we can provide some some media some hope media like you said that might oh that might help a little bit and then people can you know keep their heads above water and actually look around for for something they can do rather than feel like there's there's no point. yeah i mean like it's it, like everyone knows that the world has massive massive issues so we never the human race has never faced the problems of extinction that we're facing today like human extinction wildlife extinction um through climate change all of that kind of stuff we've never faced anything like that and i think that everyone is aware of that but you have to be able to provide hope you can't just be the world is ending goodbye it's got to be like <laughs> the world is, is could potentially end but let's take this action to make sure that it doesn't yeah um, let's not go there we don't want that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um do you think kind of in your field of conservation do you think there are stories that aren't being told that should be told um some focus of conservation work that isn't really being highlighted either in the press or in um like on social media platforms or the, any any avenues where people connect with with conservation actions and efforts do you think there are stories that are untold yeah i mean there's so many there's like millions of stories that are completely untold I, to be honest i don't think the mainstream media features anywhere near enough uh environmental um stories whether that be success stories as well because as we said like negative stories don't always work um so having success stories in there as well obviously keep people positive um i think there's so many stories told that don't and i think to be honest like sometimes the media is really irresponsible and won't report like the full the full story on something um and i think holistic so the way we've designed our organization as I said before, is to remove any barriers standing in people's ways. And I think there's definitely needs to be more media around why holistic approaches are so important because marine research is an important thing. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. Like as a scientist, I totally appreciate that like our science is integral to what we're doing, but humans are usually the environmental problem. So they have to be involved in the solution. So unless you're going to do some kind of educational outreach as well, then that problem is not going to suddenly stop like the exploitation of the oceans isn't just going to halt you've got to involve humans in that too so i think like the rhetoric there's a lot of like blame placing uh, around like the shark fin trade and around any kind of environmental problem you've got like people just being like these are the consumers that are bad and yes that's that's okay fine they shouldn't be consuming that but often they won't have the education around why they shouldn't be consuming that and also you need to cut off the supply too and when you look through the supply chain of those things like shark fishing for instance if you look through the supply chain the shark fins here are shipped off to hong kong but the guys here are getting paid like a tiny amount for it they're not doing it because they want to kill sharks they're doing it because it's a means to an end to feed their family if you can provide an alternate source of income that isn't exploitive of the ocean um and you can provide the education around why shark fishing is bad then more often than not people are going to switch to the sustainable 
income because they know that they're providing for they're making sure that their future generations are going to be able to eat from the sea as well um so i think that there needs to be more responsibility around um encompassing the whole story and making sure that there isn't just blame placing because i think it's not necessarily very constructive just being like these people are consuming it this is really bad it's their fault it needs to be a whole looking at the whole story yeah for sure for sure media has such a massive role in how people uh, perceive things and and what news they get and what news they don't i mean you know that's how it it should be that your media or your news channel or whichever wherever you go for your media should be giving you all the information that you need it just isn't that way really it's not balanced. yeah that's the thing like with our work we could share photos of dead sharks of dead whales dead manta rays whatever we could share that online but what is coming out of that all that's happening is people are getting really angry at the fishermen they are getting angry at Mozambique you potentially will have people opting out of Mozambique because of it which is working directly against what we want to do because we want to encourage tourism so that there is that alternative source of income so um yeah responsibility around media telling is really important do you think there's a role for fiction in bridging that gap that telling the stories properly from a different perspective and um giving yeah giving people a different kind of idea of oh okay well maybe maybe i shouldn't blame the fishermen who were just trying to feed their families maybe i should actually be looking somewhere completely different for for where the demand is or yeah. who's paying them yeah definitely i think if we normalized through uh, fiction if we normalized um telling stories from different backgrounds and different angles um within conservation but also within loads of different areas if you if if we could normalize so like it wasn't unusual to find a book that told the story from the shark fisherman's perspective i don't know of any fiction books that do that um but if it became more normal then people would potentially join those dots a lot easier together and it would become less of a them and us situation it would become a okay we understand each other's point of view and a lot of the time with the environmental problems when you're working with humans it's a lack of understanding of people's points of view like when we first started it was a lot and it still is a lot of conversations around like culture and around like what's appropriate and why people are doing why they what they're doing and having conversations around yeah like why the shark fin trade is going on and understanding each other's point of view is really important um to make conservation um long lasting so if we could normalize through fiction so that growing up or and as an adult you have access to a media base that is that normalizes telling stories from completely different and you don't necessarily have a hero of the story like the the classic story that i would expect to find if there is one out there of fiction around shark fishing would be like someone stopping the shark fishing and then that person would be the hero in the story right but there is a whole story around why the shark fishermen are fishing in the first place um if if it was more normal to tell that story then i think that people would understand each other's perspectives a lot more for sure i mean we're kind of seeing this kind of disconnect between people and nature especially people who have grown up in a city and they they have no connection to like the countryside around their city or they don't really go out into nature all that much they're losing this appreciation for for nature and for and for other cultures if you know if they if they don't travel very much and they they never experience other cultures and fiction has this beautiful way of like putting you in somebody else's shoes and giving you an experience that isn't yours um but you can kind of gather experiences without having to actually go anywhere um so if you can yeah if you can gather experiences from a whole different range of perspectives then people might be less just kind of knee jerk reaction of who's to blame and who's involved at all yeah exactly so you said that you don't, you don't really have a lot of time to read to read and you've already mentioned the uh the Lorax as being one of your your favorite eco fiction books or um but do you do you in your lifetime of reading do you remember reading a book that kind of made you 
feel kind of awe for nature or made you feel a bit more connected to nature? Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't really, it was more um, connecting me to like the environmental problems and changing my perspective of like what could happen in the future. I can't remember the name of the book at all. And it was back in the days pre Kindle. So I don't have it on record. <laughs> um, it's, it's probably on my like uh, bookcase at my parents house <laughs> um, <laughs> somewhere buried um, but it was a book and it was like definitely one of the more adult books that I'd read when I was a kid um, I still must have been like you know 11 or 12 at the time and it was about um, basically how we'd screwed the planet really really bad um, and we had to find another planet to live on so oh, yeah. it was um, it started on planet earth if I it was so long ago, like I'm trying to remember but it started on planet earth and then we moved on to a spaceship and we had to go and find another planet and um it was more about that like apocalyptic end of the world situation um where we just run out of resources and and what that meant and what a new planet looked like and um all of that kind of stuff so that was the one that kind of got me thinking more about uh what we're doing to the planet but also what our future could look like if we don't change things um so that was yeah probably my first step into like more adult uh, ecofiction because it was yeah more yes it was apocalyptic -y, but um it was also uh quite educational in terms of getting you to think about what your future could look like if environmental actions aren't taken so i think that was one of the first books that probably got me into thinking a bit more of the bigger picture and not living in my little bubble <laughs> yeah as I mean much. as a as a kid you don't really think about like the earth being a finite resource like you don't you don't yeah. think that far ahead so to read a book where you know the resources have run out it's it's done <laughs> you're like yeah. oh, oh this could this happen and then as soon as you start asking those questions then you're you're already moving towards like a more positive trajectory aren't you yeah yeah definitely well that is that is pretty much those are my questions for you is there anything else that you would like to add or mention um, or talk about no i don't i don't think so um no i think that's that's pretty much it just uh learning using books to learn is like such an important tool so whether that be fiction or non-fiction um it's such a useful resource so um yeah, everyone gets stuck into books. Read as much as you can. <laughs> everyone gets stuck into books. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me, Chess, and um, appearing on Ecofictology. It's, and it's, it's been so nice to see you and catch up. Um, yeah. <laughs> as for the people watching, if you have any questions for Chess, you can uh, either pop them down in the comments below and I will get them to Chess or she will see them on the channel and I'm sure she will answer them or you can find her and uh, Love the Oceans on Twitter and on Instagram pretty much at Love the Oceans right that's yeah is that the easiest yeah, yeah. way people can get in contact with you yeah uh, our website's lovetheoceans.org and then all of our social medias are at Love the Oceans um, and our Instagram is kind of our primary media. So that's, I'd recommend following us on Instagram to check out any like regular updates and things like that and what's going on. But yeah, thanks it's, very much for having me. It's a very good account to follow. It makes you oh, just want thanks. to go to Mozambique. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, so um, as for, the, so if you've enjoyed having a guest on the channel please let me know and if you have any recommendations for other guests that i should invite that you want to hear from please let me know those as well and you know the drill like the video subscribe to the channel do all the good stuff and um and i'll see you next week so thanks very much chess and uh thanks for having me talk.